we have a saying that the first paycheck beats the best paycheck. Mm. But if you have a problem, you want to solve it right away. And so if you can get people through the onboarding funnel and making money faster, that's a good way to get more people. Mm -hmm. Next is probably a lack of understanding. And some of that can be technical issues. Some of that can just be, hey, I don't know how to do this. Maybe you're nervous. Maybe you just don't understand even how to complete the onboarding flow, how to upload your docs or what docs they're asking for. Garrett Wood is the founder and CEO of GetScale. GetScale combines real one-to-one -one conversations with its proprietary data and technology platform to connect, educate, and motivate individuals to seize new opportunities, partnering with the world's largest gig economy businesses to attract and convert more than 150,000 new workers each year. Before GetScale, Garrett worked at Uber, building and scaling their first driver recruiting team to onboard millions of new drivers. So he's got a lot of experience in this. I'm excited to dig into not only your Uber history, but also, of course, what you're doing with get scale how are you doing today garrett awesome really excited to connect long time listener first time caller. Long <laughs> i will time. say I, I do think the get scale team i might have a few subscribers over there because i feel like i've gotten quite a few replies or notes to some of our podcasts from the team so i always appreciate the support and i do feel like sometimes it is kind of like free consulting my podcast but love love doing it Definitely. And personally, I've been a fan and a follower since when I joined Uber in 2015. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And I think it's probably hard to overstate the value and the insights that you've been able to provide to probably at this point, millions of people who are entering the gig economy. I was joking about it with a friend the other week, but I think for many people that are thinking about it, if they don't have a sibling or a cousin or a friend yeah. already working for or with a company like Lyft or Uber, they're already a dasher. They have sort of the same understanding of what a driver does as to what a police officer does day to day. Mm -hmm. See the cars go by. Maybe they've been in the back seat on a couple of late Saturday nights, but yeah. really don't know what the day to day looks like. So, yeah. all the resources you provide to well, make it more successful, I think, are are huge. Yeah. And I think that's one of the interesting things about driving for Uber and Lyft and working in the gig economy. It actually looks pretty straightforward, you know, like from the outside and people use it as a customer. And then once you start doing it, you kind of realize it's not rocket science, but there is a lot more to it. And especially if you want to do it in a buttoned up way, if you want to take care of insurance, if you want to make sure you have a five-star rating or whatever it might be, you sort of end up going through like all these different rabbit holes, right? So tell me a little bit about your time uh, at Uber and, you know, kind of what you worked on and what you experienced there before we get into get scale yeah definitely i like history so i'll try to keep this brief <laughs> but i started my career in sales building sales teams for a pair of vcs in michigan mm -hmm. and effectively i served as a really rapid way to test whether sales made sense for one of the products or services mm -hmm. that the portfolio companies was launching so when I joined Uber in 2015, the biggest challenge Uber was facing is that they didn't have enough drivers on the platform. If they wanted to have faster pickup times than their competitors, mm -hmm. to be more reliable, if they wanted to be able to expand their coverage, launch new markets, they needed to get and keep more drivers. Yeah. And the sort of old adage goes, if you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. I had a background in sales, so our driver recruiting challenges looked a lot like a sales problem to me, especially on the conversion side, where without getting into specific numbers, the vast majority of people who would sign up to drive mm -hmm. would never actually get started and complete the first trip mm -hmm. and start making money. So 2015, let's rewind the clock. This was, I started driving for Uber in 2014 in Orange County. So I imagine, you know, UberX had launched in most major cities and we're sort of starting to launch in some of those tier two cities. It was growing pretty fast. Was that kind of the 2015, what was the sort of state of the company and the industry? Yeah. So we were launching in cities very rapidly and I'd say, Competition probably was peaking in 2016, mm. 2017, 
but this was really going into the height of competition mm-hmm. between Lyft and Uber and some of the other competitors when driver incentives were at an all-time high, rider incentives were at an all-time high. It was really a race to establish the best marketplace and the most liquidity. So what was the sort of general acquisition strategy for Uber at the time? Was it kind of that top of funnel, get as many people, you know, signed up and then hope for the best on the conversion side? Or what was kind of the general strategy and how did it go, you think? Yeah, certainly if money alone could have solved the problem, would have solved it. Yeah. Uh, the paid channels at the time had really reached saturation. Mm. Uh, I remember doing some research, uh, but there were about 77 million Americans at the time who worked hourly jobs at comparable mm-hmm. ways to what they can make driving with Uber. And uh, Uber and all of its competitors were doing everything they could to reach them. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that we uncovered by and one of the first projects and teams that I built at Uber was starting a recruiting team that would reach out to people who had signed up to drive but never gotten started. Mm-hmm. And their mission, their job was to connect with them, educate them, not only on how to get started, but how to be successful. But most importantly, and I think most significantly, figure out what challenges they were facing in their life, whether they needed more flexibility, they needed Mm -hmm. more money, whether that's full-time or part-time work opportunity, and then show them how working with Uber could solve those problems to really motivate them to take action. And by having one-on-one conversations, Mm -hmm. we're really able to connect with people in a way. And I think more importantly, motivate them in a way that our low-touch channels alone couldn't connect or motivate them. We yeah. only get so much of a Facebook ad or an onboarding funnel, but mm-hmm. conversations can be very, very powerful. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that I noticed early on, you know, recruiting drivers for Uber really, and, you know, other services was that a lot of people, I almost feel like they just need someone to talk to. Literally, it before you even get into like the expertise and here's what it's like to be a driver, it's just more like, Hey, this is something new. I want to talk to someone about it. Like, Hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing good idea, bad idea, right? Not even necessarily an expert opinion. What do you think was sort of the number one, the most valuable aspect of having those one-on-one conversations with drivers and, you know, getting them, you know, they had signed up and shown interest, but weren't converting. What what do you think if you had to kind of nail one thing down and had to pick one, what, what might that be? If I had to pick one, it's going to be motivation. I Hmm. think there's probably three big reasons that eligible people don't start work. Mm -hmm. The first is lack of speed. We have a saying that the first paycheck beats the best paycheck. Mm -hmm. But if you have a problem, you want to solve it right away. And so if you can get people through the onboarding funnel and making money faster, that's a good way to get more people. Mm -hmm. Next is probably a lack of understanding. And some of that can be technical issues. Some of that can just be, hey, I don't know how to do this. Maybe you're nervous. Maybe you just don't understand even how to complete the onboarding flow, how to upload your docs or what docs they're asking for. But say the reason that 80% of interested and eligible applicants don't start is they just lack motivation. Hmm. everyone's busy. The main job our recruiters face, whether it's at Kidscale or with the recruiters at Uber, is really just to battle apathy. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the gym in the morning? You're tired every morning when you wake up? It's really helpful to have someone to connect with and sort of not necessarily hold you accountable, but to give you that motivation to actually follow through. Yeah, Paycheck comes in the future, but the work starts right now and it's helpful to have someone to talk through it with. 
Yeah. Well, and we're probably preaching to the choir a bit, but, you know, working in the gig economy, obviously, you know, that speed, that first paycheck beats the best paycheck, right? Uber obviously launched uh, their instant pay product. And now a bunch of other companies have added that. So you can literally get paid after every single job or day or whatever that might be. I call that the most popular driver product of all time. <laughs> you know, you can even with delivery, for example, you know, you can actually, you know, often get signed up and started and delivering, right? Because there's much lower vehicle and background check requirements. So you can get started pretty quickly with that, you know, maybe a day or less in a best case scenario. So I feel like you guys probably had some good ammo to kind of, you know, pitch, and, you know, motivate people. Yeah, definitely. And there's a reason that every major gig economy company and including a lot of staffing businesses have implemented the instant or the same day pay. It's yeah. really a requisite for many people. I talked to a nurse who used to do like on-call temp nursing mm -hmm. and one of the locations that she would sub in for paid her $5 an hour or less was also her favorite because mm. she'd get paper check at the end of every day. Like it helps to get feedback right away. So yeah. uh, I think it was a good thing for the companies to build. Cool. Anything else uh, stand out from your Uber days when it comes to recruiting drivers and conversions? No, I think probably the two big lessons. First is that real conversations can mm -hmm. impact and convert audiences that your low touch pay channels alone really cannot. The second is probably a good reminder that you're great at what you focus on. I'd spent some time working with Quicken Loans. Mm -hmm. They're one of the largest, if not the largest mortgage originators in the country. By and large, they're selling fungible product. Yeah. Money is growing. And so they're very clear that everyone in that organization is focused on supporting and enabling their salespeople to be more effective and more efficient. Uber, first and foremost, is a tech company. And I think they've built an incredible product to service yeah. their millions of riders and drivers and have an awesome, awesome app. But I think one of the struggles and sort of one of the catalysts to leave Uber in 2018 and start at scale was to build an organization where we could have all of our engineers, all of our data scientists, all of our ops people focus on making the recruiters as effective and as efficient as possible. Like their work is really sort of what's king at get scale. Yeah. And I think that was a good reminder that if you're trying yeah. to focus on two things, you're really not. Yeah, well, I think definitely, you know, Uber, I'm sure would love to be called a tech company. I mean, I think they are a tech company. And I think that is, like you mentioned, really their strength. And, you know, I think obviously we've heard from many drivers that probably like the interactions with the company is probably one of their weaknesses, right? Customer service, you know, the people side. And, you know, I think people forget, like, obviously they're operating at massive scale, doing millions of rides, you know, per hour, or per day, or whatever the stats are <laughs> these days. And, uh, you know, so when it, you know, in certain areas, you know, they might not be able to have, you know, the top notch phone agent, right. But they kind of have to operate, you know, with very large numbers. So I, I do think it kind of makes sense. You guys consider, let's talk about scale a little. You consider yourself a tech or a people company or what? Get scale, I'd say first and foremost is a tech enabled service. We really offer recruiting as a service. Got it. Um, we recruit about 150,000 new workers each year and have, you know, oftentimes north of a million unique conversations mm. every single month. Um, wow. So to be able to do that at that scale, we've invested very heavily in building out some proprietary technology to allow us to contact more people, mm -hmm. make sure we're contacting the right person via the right channel that's convenient for them at a time that makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many people you contact if you don't have quality conversations. Yeah. So it's really a wedding between the people and the technology. Got it. 
So I feel like most companies, especially on the startup side, focus on what we'll call the top of the funnel, right? Like recruiting paid ads. I mean, you mentioned, you know, what Uber was doing. I, I think back in the day, they were doing a lot of Craigslist, LinkedIn, and then Facebook and Google. And now YouTube, I think, are some of the biggest paid channels. Any I'm missing? Uh no, that's a pretty good overview. I think they've got really good programmatic on the job side, mm -hmm. really good social. I did you hit on referrals? I think that's another yeah. key. I guess driver referrals, yeah, and affiliate programs. But I guess my point, my larger point is I feel like, you know, most folks focus on that top of funnel and they don't really think about like what goes on beyond that, right? Like, hey, we put them in the funnel and then we never send them an email. Maybe, we, you know, maybe they want to learn about the company. Like Uber is different than some new rideshare company, right? Like a new rideshare company, you have to convince a driver like who they are, that they're trustworthy, that they're not a scam. Everyone knows Uber. And so, you know, we work with a lot of affiliate partners and a lot. I don't like doing a lot of affiliate deals because I could send them a thousand people and then I have no idea what their funnel is like. You know, I don't know if they're emailing them, if they're calling them, if they're texting them and I only get paid on a conversion at the end, right? And so I feel like this is something that I've always been very acutely aware of. And I don't know if it's the best way to describe what you guys do, but I always think of it as mid-funnel conversion. I don't know if there's a, a sexier name for it, but what do you think? I Mid-funnel works. Okay. I'll bring You'll take it? Yeah, I'll bring some <laughs> here. But I definitely think you're hitting on real challenge. There are a limited number of top of funnel channels. And yeah they get saturated. Mm -hmm. If you have creative that works, your competitors copy it. If you find yeah. a channel that works, your competitors enter it. And you end up, I mean, sometimes very dramatically bidding up AdWords. Yeah. I don't know what things look like right now, but I imagine if you search Lyft driver, there's a very good chance that the top search result is going to be Uber driver mm -hmm. or o -dash Dasher. Yeah. And so it's expensive to get applicants. And once you do, you certainly want to make sure that you can convert as many as possible. I think these companies have done a really great job of building a streamlined, pretty self-service funnel. Yeah. And that works for tech-savvy, intrinsically motivated people. I mean, Uber for the first few years, like if you were a cab driver, mm -hmm understood what the opportunity looked like and so it was pretty natural to get started yeah I think one thing that can become challenging is once you start to grow and get sort of further along in the user adoption curve or the innovation adoption curve you reach less tech savvy less intrinsically mm -hmm. people who maybe have more questions and that's really where conversations start to have the biggest yeah thing. So I just Googled Lyft driver and in incognito in Chrome and actually Lyft is doing a good job. They, they really dominate the first few results. They've got the sponsored, you know, so they're bidding on their own keywords Then the drive with Lyft page optimized and then a couple other pages on Lyft. And then I see three video results, which is also, I'm going to share a little loophole. The first three video results are all rideshare guy videos. So <laughs> that's like that's a tough. little bit of a loophole that, you know, we can never outrank Lyft for like a Lyft driver, although very early on. On, we did because all the Uber and Lyft, I don't think they'd hired their SEO team yet or even done any basic SEO, but you can actually pretty easily rank for a lot of top keywords on YouTube because companies don't do videos there and, you know, Google kind of pops it up in the search results. So we do a lot of that, but they're, they're doing a good job there. And actually, you know, on Lyft, I wanted to bring this up because there was a program when I first signed up in 2014, Lyft had a mentor program. Do you ever remember this or do you know what it was where a more before you could actually get on the road more ex you would call for a ride as a driver and an experienced driver would come and uh, you would sort of do a ride with them and they would sort of be like your mentor for one ride and you could ask them questions and they would get paid 35 bucks and uh, you would you know have someone to talk to i thought it was a really cool program and you know when you told me about what get scale does it reminded me of that i thought it was really effective to be honest oh like, i'm not an expert on the program but i do remember it and yeah. One way that it was really impactful is our sort of recipe for driver or worker churn is mm -hmm. a bad experience plus poor support equals mm -hmm. these companies, I think, are 
investing in better and better support. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing the mentor program did really well is to sort of provide a foundation of education. And this is what it looks like to give a good ride with Lyft. And if you go in with that knowledge and with that foundation, I think the chance that you run into a poor experience yeah. dramatically decreases and you can do a lot to decrease the number of people yeah. who sign up, try it out, have a bad experience and then say, Hey, it's not for me. Yeah. With that said, I think it's something that the companies have to balance. Not everyone needs it. Not everyone wants it. Mm -hmm. It adds friction to the funnel can delay when people can get started. But I do think there's something very valuable and insightful there, which is some upfront education on how to be successful can do a lot to not only make the person experience and yeah. earn a potential hire, but to also keep people working for longer. Yeah. So let's dive into some of the more tactical and strategy side when it comes to acquisition and conversions for drivers, gig companies. You know, I think you mentioned something interesting, right? The top of funnel, everyone's kind of advertising it. Like it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Oh, maybe we should advertise Google and Facebook and Craigslist and LinkedIn. You know, like the main channels are pretty obvious. And then you can see what other people are doing. And you can kind of like, I don't think there's a real moat there. It's hard to stand out. You know, maybe if you have more funding, you can spend. End, but you know, I guess what are your what's your sort of best advice for gig companies? You know, anyone that's hiring a lot of workers when it comes to that acquisition and conversion side. Like, what's the first thing you you know you always go in, you see, and it's like, oh, we got to fix this first. Oh, that's a great question. At this point, most of the companies have a pretty established foundation. Mm -hmm. I think everything you can do to streamline the funnel and get people working faster is going to be really impactful mm. on the conversion side. The other thing I think it, that's really important is to match the right flow to the right channel. And so if people are coming in via referral, they probably have more contacts. Mm. You probably spend less time filtering people out who may not be qualified. You yeah. may be able to invest with the last or at least sort of bombard the person with a little less than Yeah, that's actually a good point. They sort of um, already, you know, if you've been referred by another driver, or even if you came in from an affiliate channel, you know, you read a thousand word article on the rideshare guy, you've got some context, you've got someone you can talk to or reach out to. So they might be more high intent, like, hey, I'm, I'm like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm clicking, I'm ready to go. Don't, don't bug me with a lot of stuff I don't need. Oh, th this is getting into the nitty gritty a little bit. And I think other companies are starting to do it, but we have two core services. Mm -hmm. uh, first, we call funnel conversion. This is where our partners share applicants that they've generated. And then we use a dedicated team to connect, educate, and motivate them to get started. The other service that we offer, we call full service. And this is where we combine our own top of funnel marketing to generate mm -hmm new applicants, people who either wouldn't be interested in the mm -hmm. economy, maybe they have preconceived notions, other sort of hard to reach demographics with our dedicated recruiting team. But something we've invested in very heavily there is what we call CRO or conversion rate optimization. And we will set up different lead flows based on sort of the quality of the channel I think in terms of top of funnel marketing, there's sort of a trinity where you can have either great volume and great cost. Mm -hmm. You can have great cost and great quality, but no volume. Mm -hmm. Or you can have great volume, and great cost, but really poor quality or whatever. Yeah. I think you guys get the sort of trifecta that you're going for. And for our lower quality channels where the cost is great and mm -hmm. we can get a lot of volume, we can do some things up front to make sure that we are filtering out and educating and selecting for the right applicants. Mm -hmm. Then on the inverse of that, for really high quality channels, we do everything we can to sort of remove barriers up front and make it really easy for people to get into the flow and sign up. Mm -hmm. so I think it really comes to 
matching the right flow and sometimes in our cases the right outreach to the right person based off of all the attributes you know about them. Yeah. Well, I think you also mentioned on sort of the product, I guess this is kind of like how it dovetails into the product side, right? Like you, you said working faster. I really like that. You know, we talked about the instant pay. I also thought about a new term instant work, right? Like if I'm signing up for Uber or Uber Eats and you know, let's say I sign up for Uber, for example, and you know, I think they've done a little bit of a, you know, this in the past and probably doing a good job of, Hey, maybe it takes a few days to get qualified for rideshare. You want to try delivery? We can get you approved and working for that right now today. I don't know. What do you think? Is there any sort of examples on the product side of like helping people work faster or, you know, optimizations they can make? Uh, well, one thing I think can help if you can't get people just working faster mm -hmm. is at least start interacting with them mm. and so they understand where they are in the funnel. And you can start to at least rest their attention Mm -hmm. And make sure that they understand, okay, I may not be able to get started right now, but mm -hmm. I know where I am in this flow. I have reasonable expectations about when I can start working, when I can start making money. And as a result of that, I have confidence in the solution. Yeah. If your background check goes into a black box and you have no idea when you'll actually be able to start working. If you have a problem, you need to solve it. You need yeah. money to pay down credit card debts right now, or you need money to buy tickets to go to your friend's bachelor ride or bachelor party. Mm -hmm. You have to start earning money for that right now. Maybe it's okay if you got started this weekend or next weekend, but if you don't know when you'll be able to get started, you'll find yeah. an option that you have confidence in. So I think in the absence of being able to get people started sooner, mm -hmm. you can at least give them more visibility into where they are and when they're likely to be able to get started. So they yeah. say, okay, I've got confidence in this. I don't need to start looking for other solutions. Yeah. This, this reminds me of a video I did. I just pulled it up. It was from 2015. So pretty early. Don't I, I'll share a link in the show notes, but don't anyone watch it because it's uh, not the most polished video, but it's my number one piece of advice for new Uber drivers. And I believe the gist of the video was like, go out and take a ride as a passenger, you know, while you're waiting to be approved, you can talk, you know, kind of do like a little mini, you know, free mentor session basically. And I know that, well, that video has over 200,000 views. So it was definitely popular, but yeah, I, I like that advice of sort of setting the right expectation, you know, kind of giving them something to do, you know, or some, you know, warm up action they can take, you know, in the meantime, while they're approved or, you know, while they're in the funnel. Probably. Yeah. That, that's a great insight. Yeah. So you mentioned two core services that you offer funnel conversion and full service. You talked a little about the full service. Tell me what are the details of the kind of funnel conversion, which I, I believe is kind of your main uh, offering. How does it work uh, in detail and, you know, um, what do you guys do? Yeah, so our clients, our partners, share applicants that they have generated mm -hmm. through their own marketing channels. We then use a dedicated team to contact and convert those applicants to active workers on the platform. Mm -hmm. For all of our self-service funnels, and this is the vast majority of the partners we work with, we're able to run a constant A-B test. Mm. So let's say... 20% of applicants just get our partner's regular comms and go through the regular funnel. 80% mm -hmm. of applicants get the regular comms, go through the regular funnel, plus they get outreach from one of our dedicated teams. Gotcha. We measure the delta in conversion from application to active worker between the treatment group who gets our outreach and the control group that does not get any outreach to understand our impact and yeah. varies by partner, it varies by role and which markets we're in. Sure. We're able to generate anywhere from 10 to 50% new work, like more new workers each month mm. by providing that hands-on outreach. Got it. And then you only charge the platform, the gig company that you're partnering with for that increase, that Delta basically in value that you're bringing. Exactly. We call them incremental workers and that's gotcha. the value that we're able to provide. 
All right. So let me see if I can explain it back to you. So let's say a company, a gig company, it starts with a hundred thousand drivers that they are acquiring from, you know, Facebook and Google ads and all the different sources they sign up. And then some percent of those drivers typically convert, let's say it's 5% convert and they're at 5,000. Now they've got a bunch of people left in that pipeline and you guys might go in and take half of them, half of the remaining 95,000 or some percentage and half of that 95,000 would go through the company's own funnel and sort of see what they convert at. And then the other half you guys would take and, you know, sort of use your dedicated call agents and hopefully have a higher or typically have a higher conversion rate than the platform. Does that, does that sort of sound right? Yeah. For more simple math. <laughs> I started with, I was trying to think, I was, I was trying to think what would be the most simple number. I, I went with a hundred thousand because it was like a hundred base hundred, but I don't know if that was the simplest way to explain it. Oh, totally. Let's just say a uh, hundred people, a hundred applicants were assigned to the treatment group. Mm -hmm. So they're eligible to receive outreach from our team. Got it. We have the constant AB test. We look at the control group and we know uh, okay. out of those 100 applicants would have started without our outreach. Gotcha. 20 people from the treatment group to convert, to start working for our partners, yeah. we know that 20 minus 10, we generated 10 incremental workers yeah. and that we charge for it. Got it. Okay. That is a, a much more simple explanation. But you know what? I, I gave it a, hopefully A for effort. <laughs> no, and uh, I like the numbers, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, cause I know that you, I imagine, you know, with some of these partners, you know, I know they're not signing up just a hundred drivers. I'm sure they're more in the thousands or tens of thousands. What, what, that's a good question. What type, what's like your ideal partner? What's someone that like, what kind of volume, what kind of, uh, you know, acquisition costs do they need to be paying in general ballpark, you know, it's to sort of be a good fit to hire and work with a, a partner like GetScale. Yeah. At a minimum, they're recruiting recruiting, I'd say 500 plus, oftentimes that number is more like 5,000, 10,000 plus new workers mm -hmm. every single month. And they ideally have a cost per hire of 100 or 150 plus. The number can be much higher in mm -hmm. your most saturated markets, but we're usually able to start to play ball and yeah boost their cost per hire and solve a real challenge. If they're recruiting a thousand plus people per month and mm -hmm. cost per hire CAC in the low hundreds. Got it. Are there any sort of macro, you know, events or, you know, kind of job market or anything that you look at that's sort of beyond your control that sometimes you say, oh, wow, this is a, you know, good idea for a company to work with us. Like, I guess I'm thinking like delivery and packages. We always get a company, a bunch of companies reaching out to us, like in Q3, Q4, like, hey, we need to hire a bunch of new drivers because Christmas is coming up, you know, Amazon Flex, obviously, right. You know, summer, you know, uh, travel and, you know, with rideshare, we always know that it's busier, you know, in kind of Thanksgiving, New Year's, you know, that timing. Do you guys think about any of that? Or is there anything that sort of inspires, uh, you know, conversations around that? Yeah, definitely. We do the vast majority of our work ramping up sort of in Q3, then in Q4 and Q1. And we oftentimes, although not always, see a little bit of a summer slowdown. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly varies by partners. And this sounds very cliche or maybe sort of a bad saying, but there's a reason they call call centers a call center. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge advantage of having a centralized team because you're able to flex their focus mm -hmm. into the markets or in some instances, the roles that, that are most pressing at the time because mm -hmm. the supply needs or the new worker needs in Seattle can vary dramatically month over month. Yeah. Or maybe you need a ton of new workers in Austin, where I sit this month, and a ton of new workers in Detroit the next month. It's really helpful to have a centralized team so you can shift their focus to the markets or the roles that are most pressing at that time. Yeah, and no, I think I think that's a, a challenge. 
Very good point. You brought up the city by city. I remember having a conversation uh, and I think I ended up interviewing someone from Uber about this on my podcast. I'm kind of blank. I remember I, I chatted with Andrew McDonald from Uber on Twitter and I can't remember if he was the one who came on the podcast. I think it was he came on the podcast to discuss during the pandemic. I think San Francisco, for some reason, was one of you know Uber's cities that was very slow to recover. So it was sort of interesting because, you know, like city by city, like just depending on some of the market and, you know, Los Angeles, I think had some issues too, that, you know, depending on a lot of geography or city or other factors, like some markets, you know, companies might need a lot more help when it comes to acquisition than others too. So I think that's a good point. Yeah. I think it's a Nassim Taleb quote, but mm -hmm. don't cross a river that's on average four feet deep. Mm. <laughs> the supply state I think can look really healthy on a macro level. But that doesn't make it any better for people ordering food or groceries yeah. who ride in the cities or at the times where it's not healthy. And so having a team that can really focus to yeah. increase conversion in those markets by 10, 20, sometimes as high as 50 percent can be really impactful for making sure that not only on a macro level or a countrywide level, you're good, but yeah. on a market level. You're also yeah, well. definitely. Well, I like that quote a lot, and I think I expect to see it on a little uh, framed poster in your office sometime soon. But anything else you want to hit on before we wrap up here when it comes to conversions and you know talking to drivers? No, I think as people think about potentially building a recruiting team internally, mm -hmm. the one reminder that I would give everyone is that, and I actually have, I think I can probably illustrate this by talking about an insurance company that we've worked with a little bit. I a very well-meaning director of sales mm -hmm. had set up their team to maximize the amount of revenue per rep that they were generating. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like the right metric, but in practice, many of the people who are signing up for a policy were going to get it regardless of mm. whether or not they talk to someone. They want to add real incremental value and actually grow the business. They need to think about how do we maximize the incremental number of policies or the incremental yeah. number of workers that each rep is generating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To do that, you need to run really solid A-B tests. Yeah. And then you need to continue to iterate on how to not only make the baseline conversion higher and the funnel higher, but how can the team continue to add more value by talking to the right person via the right message at the right time. I think with that, probably the last thing I would add is the biggest thing our recruiters are selling it Mm -hmm. against or solving it's not a technical issue it's not understanding it's just apathy people mm -hmm. are busy it takes a lot of motivation to start something new whether it's yeah. a new exercise habit or a new job and the most important thing that they do is just have a conversation to figure out what challenges someone is facing figure out how a better work opportunity could solve those problems yeah. And then use that to motivate them to take action. To get is, is that the biggest challenge when it comes to signing up rideshare and delivery drivers in the gig economy? Is it sort of motivating them and, you know, helping them overcome? I don't know if it's apathy or, you know, sometimes it's also like, hey, this is a new thing. This seems like I, I, it's a little risky. Like, what if I do it and it doesn't work out? It's a bunch, you know, wasted time, right? Like, what, what is the biggest challenge you found, you know, when talking to these drivers? People are busy. Yeah, uh, people are busy. Yeah, people are busy. It's never a good time to mm. start something new, especially when the payout for that can come a week or months in the future if you're saving up for something. Mm -hmm. And so I really think the core of the value comes from motivation. Yeah. Well, and again, I think it like you keep reminding me that, man, there's so much good 
ammunition. I don't know if that's the best word, but you know, there's so much good, you know, kind of points, right? Like if someone, if I'm talking to a driver and they told me that, Hey, you know, like, Oh, far off in the future, you know, one of the great things about gig economy is from literally job one, you are making money, right? Like (laughs) you are going to, maybe it's not as much as you want. Maybe there's a learning curve, but you do that first trip, that first delivery, you will get paid. You will cash out that, you know, get that instant pay. So I do feel like it's not a job where you kind of have to oversell a lot, right? Like all the things that you can hype up and that people love are kind of true. Of course, there's plenty of downsides, right? Like any job or form of work. But I do think that like all these, you know, sort of fears or apprehensions that people have, you, your, your recruiters have really good answers for them. Totally. At this point, we've had well north of 20 million conversations. I wow. joke with the team that the plural of anecdote is data, but mm-hmm. it's only given us some unique and in-depth insights into yeah. the concerns, the challenges, and again, I think most significantly, the yeah. motivations that people have when they're looking for a new job. Yeah. And I think just to sort of put a pin in it, I think the other big theme that I'm hearing and I'm kind of learning from you today is really streamlining the acquisition, streamlining the funnel, making it easy. And then it almost seems like, you know, hey, if people want to like sign up, never talk to a person, just click, 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 and they're ready to go. And that all works. Let them do that. That's great. And then for everyone else who kind of drops off or starts to have an issue or has, you know, something that uh, they don't want to, you know, some reason why they don't want to do it, lack of motivation or whatever, that's sort of where you know, a recruiting team like at scale comes in and they can kind of, you know, provide a little bit of an additional support or boost or motivation, like you said. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great summary and synthesis. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, if folks want to reach out to you or learn more about get scale, uh, where can they go? Where can they find you? Yeah. First thing, follow me on Pinterest. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> find me on LinkedIn. I was about to say, I haven't heard that one before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Find me on LinkedIn, Garrett Wood. Cool. Or entire website, getscale.com, G-E-T-S-C-A-L-E.com. Right. Awesome. We will leave a link in the show notes to both of those and appreciate you coming on, Garrett. Awesome. Thanks for watching today's episode of the Rideshare Guy podcast. For more information on today's guests, please check the description. Now, you don't want to miss this interview of the Rideshare Guy podcast, so click here and also make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future ones. See you next time.